Hello, I'm Jonas Sherevinsky, and you're watching TVP World Talks, where every word matters. Clearly, words are going to be uh, taking the center stage in the U.S. later on, as President Volodymyr Zelensky is going to present his victory plan. But this is not just about the wording of the plan, about which we don't really know that much yet. It is also about principles. It is also about how the Western world understands this conflict and whether Western leaders are willing to go the extra mile to help Ukraine fend off Russian aggression. So what does the peace plan contain? What is likely to be its reception and what are the misconceptions concerning uh, what a just peace would actually amount to. We're going to ask these questions and more to our guest today, Stefan Korshak, senior defense correspondent at the Kiev Post. Hello and welcome to TVP World. Hi, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So I've seen some skeptical articles. Uh, there were even some arguably rather uninformed takes as to what this plan sets out to achieve. Some commentators say uh, it is not likely to achieve success. So what is your opinion? Do you think that President Zelensky may actually convince the U.S. leadership, the current or the future one, that they should do more? It depends on how what your definition of more is, but uh, I think that the Zelensky administration views this as a step in a process and that they do not have the goal to come back with uh, major, uh, firm, long-term commitments. Uh, they understand that the uh, U.S. political system is in flux and that uh, the uh, elections, only after the elections, there will be a possibility to get harder decisions from uh, the U.S. Uh, national leadership. So the point uh, of this visit is to lay out Ukraine's position to uh, both uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, and also to, uh, if you will, uh, take the lead in the narrative about how uh, Ukraine and its allies uh, could and should go forward. So, um, for, from the Ukrainian point of view, it's all, it's a lot about messaging. It's a lot about taking the lead in uh, the way that uh, the war might go and how it might move towards resolution. And it's about uh, trying to mold, to the extent that it's possible, uh, the U.S. stance towards Ukraine. So we don't really know the details of the plan. We know a few things which have been mentioned by President Zelensky in the course of interviews. One of the things that he recently said is that the plan is not about negotiating with Russia, probably because Russia doesn't really negotiate in good faith. He didn't say that openly, but we have to assume this is the case. The plan is about strengthening Ukraine so that there can be a just peace. And he also suggested this might happen much earlier than everybody thinks and that this autumn will be crucial. What do you think? Is it really the case that we don't really need to have Russia at the negotiating table, given their track record of negotiating, agreeing to do things, and then breaking its promises? I think it's, uh, it, by some interpretation, certainly it's possible. Uh, it seems like uh, the Zelensky administration uh, wants very much to make it very clear that uh, territory is not something that they are going to negotiate on, but they are willing to uh, be flexible on uh, how a ceasefire is moved towards. And uh, there are some things that they absolutely, they'll just keep fighting instead if uh, some conditions are not met. Uh, the one that they're clearest about is security guarantees. Uh, essentially, if uh, Ukraine does not have uh, real security guarantees from major allies that uh, are that give combat power, meaningful combat power on the battlefield, then Ukraine has no option but to keep on fighting, and therefore a ceasefire is impossible. So uh, the idea that the Ukrainians have is to get that message out, and um, if it molds the way that. Uh, uh, future negotiations between other states and Russia uh, play out, and this can be in terms of sanctions, it can be in terms of uh, countries that might be uh, associated with Russia now and might le be less so in the future, then that's part of uh, the Zelensky administration's uh, diplomatic goals. Uh, they might be able to achieve some of those goals, that is, uh, for instance, uh, security commitments in uh, the autumn and the fall, 
According to Bloomberg, it's about NATO membership. According to Bloomberg, the plan will include uh, an express statement that uh, Ukraine should receive invitation to NATO. Do you think this is possible? And also, how is it going to play out in the conversation with Trump? Because we know that Trump has a very specific view about NATO, one that some people have described as transactional, but also uh, the J.D. Vance plan, or the, uh, the sketch of a plan that he has outlined during an interview. How do you think this is going to play out? Well, um, uh, to take the uh, in reverse, the JD plan is an absolute non-starter in Ukraine. The Ukrainians simply will fight. They 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 are willing to fight and die rather than give up uh, terrain and uh, population within it. Uh, that's just simply a non-starter for them. And, and give uh, up NATO other, membership. That's what JD is proposing. NATO membership uh, is less of a hard condition in uh, Ukraine than uh, a security guarantees. The Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian leadership does not say this specifically, but uh, the uh, high-end media, the uh, people that we talk to at my newspaper, make it clear that Ukraine does not see NATO in and of itself as the only way that Ukrainian security can be guaranteed. and uh, How could it be guaranteed, if I may, because Ukraine already had security guarantees under the Budapest Memorandum? We unfortunately can see how this turned out. In the Ukrainian mind, uh, a guarantee is not something that's on paper. It's military material. It's support. It's money. And uh, they uh, have a very clear example that uh, it's hard to overstate how much they appreciate it, of uh, actual meaningful support that has come from um, Ukraine's allies. Uh, Poland is among the leaders. And uh, what they would, I think, like to see first and foremost is that kind of relationship and that kind of support be uh, solidified and formalized, uh, if you will, on a bilateral basis with many separate states from the Ukrainian point of view. That works. That's real. That has happened, and that has given results. Uh, they are not willing just to give up on NATO without concessions from the Russians. They know how to negotiate. They know how the Russians negotiate. So I don't think that you're going to see the Ukrainians say, well, okay, we give up on NATO just because we feel like we're nice. That would come at a price. But uh, from the Ukrainian geopolitical, the strategic, the security point of view, they don't see NATO as an organization, I think, that is the only way that Ukrainian security can be uh, maintained. They, they see other ways that it's done, and they have to be realistic. They're not talking theoretically. They're in a real war. So what should be Ukraine's expectations now? Because we essentially have like two branches of these upcoming talks. We have the Democrats, we have the Republicans. We've already covered the Republicans briefly, so now let's turn to the Democrats. Uh, some people say it would be more of the same if Kamala Harris wins, but it's a question of really whether the administration will relax the limitations on deep strikes using Western weapons. So do you think this may happen? Skeptics say it's always going to be too provocative for the US, so they will always keep saying, uh, no, you can't do that. But this is crucial for Ukraine, because otherwise it will be exposed to Russian strikes. Well, Ukraine is exposed to Russian strikes right now. There's no question of that. And um, it doesn't seem like uh, that a major state uh, like, let's say, uh, Poland, the United States, is going to intervene on the ground. So those strikes will continue in the future. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, pres the, the presence of long-range strike, strike weapons in Ukrainian hands, this is not even a matter of debate. Everybody can see it. It's not a question of giving a few uh, very effective weapons to the Ukrainians. This is a giant war. There are hundreds of thousands of soldiers mobilized on both sides. Uh, there are tens of thousands of uh, vehicles that have been destroyed over the in the combat. There's hundreds of thousands of people, uh, soldiers dead and wounded. And 50 of the very best weapons in the world simply are not going to change the course of the war substantially. The Ukrainians understand this very, very well. Well, that's a and, fair point. Uh, but if uh, I may, uh, again, the uh, question of weapons which Ukraine already has, like the attackums, Ukraine would like to use them in the same way that it already uses its own weapons, like drones, like experimental weapon types. And when it strikes against Russian targets, including ammunition depots, which just keep exploding for many hours on end, causing many earthquakes, 
have we seen any escalation from Russia? No, we didn't. So why this fear that if it was a Western weapon instead of a homemade, home-brewed Ukrainian one, if it did the same thing, that that would actually cause a major out outburst of rage from Putin? Should well, we be so obsessed I, with escalation? Yeah, Should yeah, our I, leaders I, be? I, I basically agree with you. Um, honestly, I think that that question is better asked to your correspondents, uh, you know, in, in the United States and Germany, for instance. Uh, it's not again not a matter for debate. You don't even have to like discuss it. It's very clear that uh, when, as you point out, the uh, Ukrainians and in this case using their own weapons uh, make major strikes. Uh, the, the latest round of ammu ammunition dump attacks. Uh, we did some research in my newspaper, and we think that it was uh, the most effective airstrikes against Russia since the World War. Well, since World War II, just hugely effective uh, Ukrainian weaponry. Uh, it hasn't brought Russia to the knee, its knees. Russia is still fighting. So um, the hesitation in the West is, uh, to a certain extent, uh, their internal politics and perhaps, fr from the Ukrainians' pr perspective, uh, the national leaderships in some countries' unwillingness to uh, look at a major conventional war honestly and to th think honestly about what it takes to get results in a war. And uh, so a lot of the debate is about uh, the, pol the politics of a measure that, although effective, for instance, attackums are one of the most effective weapons that the Ukrainians have, uh, unless it's in scale, it's not decisive. So uh, does it mean the Ukrainians can't use it? Of course not. They can use it very effectively. But in a major war, uh, scale is critical. And uh, that debate isn't happening. And the why that debate isn't happening is a question that has to be, you know, in places like Washington and uh, Berlin. That's where that debate is taking place and needs to be looked at. And that is a very, very powerful point indeed. Some have even suggested that Ukrainians know what it takes to win a war, but do Western leaders actually still know it? Do they still remember what it takes to achieve victory? Well, perhaps a victory plan may actually help them remember. Stefan Korshak was our guest today here on TVP World. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. And I'm Yonash Ravinsky. You're watching TVP World. Please do stay with us for more latest news and updates.